Now, what if someone goes into the gym, mm-hmm. they follow that protocol. Yeah. So they have to focus. They are taking the sets to a point where the speed of their reps drops off dramatically towards yeah. the end. And they need longer than a 30 to 60 second rest between sets in order to recover. But they don't necessarily feel sore the next day. Do you have to feel soreness in the muscles that you've trained in order for that to be beneficial? You don't. Some soreness is normal. Extreme soreness comes usually from two things. It's new or it's too much. And so the first one is we have this thing in exercise called the repeat about effect. So if you go to the gym and you do something, the first time you do it, it's totally new. You are going to be so sore. You're not going to be able to like walk down the steps or sit down without that soreness or, you know, that cliche jokes about that because it's new. But if you go and do the same thing again next week, your body will be less sore because it's going to elicit less of an inflammatory response. It, it knows that. It sees and, it, and, it, and it's like, oh, I know this stressor and stimulus. This isn't as threatening. I'm gonna, or you're adapting to it or your body wants to adapt to that stress and stimulus that's skidding, but you have less of an inflammatory response. So you're less sore. Soreness is really just this immune response and inflammatory response that's like localizing at the muscle cells and that it's perceived by your nervous system. It's not necessarily like, oh, you're sore because your muscles are doing better. It's just a perception of this, this inflammatory response. And so you have less of that response the second time you see it. And it's usually eccentric exercise that does that more than anything else. So like if you run downhill a bunch, you're going to be really, really sore, but you're not growing muscle. Like that's the cliche model in exercise science is like downhill running is ex- extreme eccentric muscle damage, puts a ton of damage in your muscles, elicits a huge immune response and people are super sore, but you're not growing muscle just because you're running downhill. So or else so- bodybuilders would be out yeah. there Yeah, that's downhill actually my running. secret. That's my secret, all the downhill <laughs> running. Um, and so what you really want to think about is – is maybe being in that two to four range on average. And every time you do a new exercise or you start a new block of training or you try something new or you bump up volume, like you might be a little sore. And it's not, it's not a bad thing. Like you should, you shouldn't not never be sore. I think that that the antagonist to like everyone being like soreness doesn't mean a good workout or muscle growth is people think that like, well, if you're working hard, you're gonna be sore or fatigued. And at least shows you that you were working. That muscle yeah. group. Yeah. You should have some soreness or fatigue. And the more adaptable your program is or the more you do stuff or, you know, potentially like sometimes I feel more sore if I'm doing more of a high volume hypertrophy phase or heavy volume lifting than I do when I'm like doing more strength work. I don't feel as sore or fatigued in that same muscular localization way because I, it's just not as much volume because it's like you're doing less reps. So it, even though it's heavy, it's not as fatiguing. So it doesn't always necessarily mean it's not working, but you're going to have some sort of localized fatigue or soreness. It just shouldn't be, if it's greater than like a five or six out of 10, every single time you leave the gym, something's off with your sleep, your nutrition, or you're doing too much in the gym. Like one of those three things are impacting your recovery. Um, but also on that note, if you're sore, but you feel like you're doing a perfect amount of training volume, like look at your sleep and your nutrition because it might not be your program that's the issue. It might be like the things that are affecting your recovery. Um, but I think people think too on that that I think makes this a little bit more clear is you don't need a million exercises as well. I think that's an important note to add to this too is I think people think that they need to be doing a million exercises. Um, and you need maybe four to six high quality exercises where you feel like you're doing work. You're going to feel like you, you put an effort. You might feel a little bit fatigued or tired to have that carried in into your next session or day, but it shouldn't be this, like, I can't walk down the steps or lift up my hand to brush my hair every single time that you're working out. Is that yeah. counterproductive? Yeah. I think training to that point of soreness every single time you train, something's off. You're doing too much. You're, it's too novel all the time. You're not adapted to what you're doing or you're not eating or sleeping in a way that you're recovering from what you're doing. And so if you, you do these consistent repeated training programs, your soreness is going to really go away. And I think if you think about like the hybrid training thing, that's a good thing, right? Because you're going to bring soreness and fatigue in from session to session. But if you can keep it as regular and controlled and reduce that, then you're going to get higher quality in everything that you're doing because it's not going to carry over quite quite as much as if you do this, the same new thing every single week of training or these haphazard random workouts or random programs. Like even some of the like circuit training or CrossFit type models, usually the programming is still made to be like re- somewhat repeatable and consistent versus like, you know, the woman who's just doing a random different thing every single day of the week, or they randomly lift this day and they're going to do this this day. And they don't really know what they're doing when they go into the gym. And they might not 
you know, they might be more sore than the work they actually put in just because it's new and different, not even because it was like quality of what they were doing. Is it okay to enter a workout with some soreness? So let's, if we come back to this example of growing glutes or, you know, yeah. someone that's doing squatting on a Monday mm -hmm. and let's say they want to do this workout twice a week. So Thursday rolls around and they're a little bit sore. Is it okay to go and do yeah. those same exercises again that work out or uh, stress those sore muscles? Yeah. So training with soreness and fatigue is normal. It's going to happen, especially if you train hard and you train long enough. Um, that's why that's a big reason though I like spreading that volume of different muscle groups across the week because it helps kind of reduce some of that soreness and fatigue because you're spreading it out so it's like a little bit more distributed. Um, but if you're doing like a leg or a full body day on Monday and then you're doing another one on Thursday and you have a little bit of residual fatigue or soreness, and again, it's not like I can't walk, I'm so sore, I'm like I'm almost swollen kind of soreness and fatigue, yeah, you're totally fine. That's completely normal. I get this a lot of the time too with like people who lift and do running. They're like, can I run on sore or fatigued legs? And I was like, I haven't not ran on sore or fatigued legs in like six years. Like it's just part of training hard and that just comes with the territory of it. You're not harming anything unless it's to that extreme point where you're just damaging stuff that's damaged and not recovered. Like that's kind of goes back to what I said earlier, where like, are you digging yourself into a deeper hole than, than you need to be digging yourself into? So it's not that it's inherently bad, but if you are at like an eight out of 10 soreness, you don't feel recovered, you feel super beat up. And a great indication of that is if you go into that next session and you can't have that same strength or power output or like muscular power, because you're going to have a lot of inflammation and fluid and swelling in those muscles, it's probably an indication that, okay, I probably overdid it on that day, or maybe I need to take an extra day for this to recover. Because that peak of that soreness is usually about 48 to 72 hours after a training session, that peak of that inflammatory response. But if you feel like, okay, I'm, I can't move anything in this, you probably just need to take a step back, recover, maybe do something that's going to Prioritize just, recovery. Yeah. What do you think about cold water immersion? And it's where I get canceled on this podcast. Whether, <laughs> it, is it helpful at all for reducing muscle soreness and promoting recovery? So it is, but it potentially is at the cost of muscle growth and that inflammatory process is important. So, you know, when you look at cold water immersion, it's, it's not that I think that if you're doing it, you're a terrible person, you should stop and you're stupid. It's that I think it should be intentionally used strategically. So when we look at you know, the muscle's response to that cold water immersion, especially like if you're actually physically dunking yourself in ice, it does blunt and decrease an inflammatory response that we're getting from exercise. But we want that inflammatory response that we're getting for exercise. And so the literature shows that if you do it, especially immediately after resistance training, you're potentially blunting or reducing those effects of that training session. We don't have data right now that says, well, what if you do it before? Or what if you do cold water showers instead? Or four hours after. Or four or hours, hours after. after. I'm more inclined to say to do it before maybe than like after, because that recovery response is occurring for days after. Like it's, it's that inflammatory response that we're having in response to training. It's, you know, it's there for 24, 48, 72 hours after. Right. So, but if you do it before is and it, you train today yeah, before like, that, it's, it's within that window now. It's still within that. So like I, I, you know, but when you look at it though, it doesn't appear to impact performance or things um, after like there was like mis, mixed martial, martial arts or fighter type people that they looked at and it appeared to not necessarily impact that. Um, and it does look like it doesn't negatively impact adaptations to aerobic training. It might actually potentially enhance those. So if you're going to do it, you know, maybe you're doing it after cardio training sessions or other forms of things. Or maybe if you're in your season of specifically trying to gain muscle strength and hypertrophy, you're reducing that or pulling that back. It's just like the cardio thing. It doesn't fully stop it from happening. You're still going to probably gain muscle to some degree. It just might be reducing that the extent of which that might happen. And I think a, the, there's this, this bias of people who, again, have already been muscular, who started doing this cold water immersion. And they're like, it didn't kill my gains. I'm like, but you, you still have the muscle that you developed when you didn't do it. So I think that, you know, but that's where it's beneficial is like the reason people use it in sporting events or between like 
inter like intervals at the CrossFit Games or between back-to-back -back races or these things. It's because you don't you don't care about adapting in those period of time. You care about reducing that inflammatory response because you don't want to be sore and have that fatigue or that impaired muscle power output that happened. Because essentially, what happens when you're fatigued or sore, you don't you don't, your muscle fibers don't generate as much power. So you don't, but you're not trying to adapt in those moments. Like you know, they're they're just trying to recover between session to session. So that there's this people who are like, well. My favorite basketball player did ice water immersions, and they were a great athlete. Yeah, and I'm like, but they weren't in that moment between games. They weren't caring about hypertrophy. No, they're just trying to get up for the next game. They're just trying to get up for the next game. So that the the cons for it in response to resistance training is a pro when it comes to short term recovery, but not long term muscular adaptations. But I think that that. You know, if people like it and they want to do it, I don't, I just like, I don't care. I don't think it's the optimal thing for muscle strength and hypertrophy. So if you're going to do it, place it on its own or potentially around cardiovascular training, or maybe don't do it every single day of, of, of the week. Um, you know, or say, Hey, I've got the muscle that I want and I don't really care. Like but that's important yeah. for the person who is feeling stuck and doesn't have yeah. the muscle that they want. Yes. You know, maybe they're. 50 or 60, they're at that stage of menopause, mm -hmm. they're finding it difficult to build muscle, then what I'm hearing from you is this might be something that is counterproductive yeah. to their goal, their yeah. specific goal at that point of time. Yeah, at, at least with that. Like when I talk about this, people are like, well, I, I found X, Y, and Z other benefits from that. I'm like, you very well may, and like that's totally fine. But I think that we need to recognize, especially especially for females, is how important that muscle is and how, I mean, for everyone with aging, but especially like when you go through peri and postmenopause, like that, that is the most important thing to preserve and try to keep or build before you go into that. It's like your resiliency army armor to all these things. And so, you know, I, I really think that that's where you might want to consider the pros versus cons or the frequency or how much you're using it if you do like it, especially at the expense of your muscle. And so it's not to say if you like it, you can't do it, but I would be considerate about how you're utilizing it. Um, in response to those things or take it out for a season of life while you are specifically building and focusing. And that's the same thing with cardio. Like people are like, well, I did a ton of cardio and, and killed my gains or impaired this. And I'm like, well, you just need to pull down the volume of that to ramp up that lifting if that's your specific goal. And that's where I take those seasons with that as well of like, make the goal the goal. Like, you know what I mean? Like when you're focusing on one thing, make the goal the goal. But when it comes to recovery, I think that People want all these fancy bells and whistles of everything that you can do, but the sleep and the nutrition are going to be the biggest drivers and then volume management in your training. If, you, if you're doing more volume than you can recover from, then you're never going to do it. And I, and I like to say, people think when I say that, that means that you can't ever do high volume or it's counter to the fact that I exercise like 10 hours a week, but high volume is earned. You can't adapt to it with time, but you can't, you can't start up here. You have to build up the capacity to recover and tolerate what you're doing gradually over time. And then you can't do more and more and more. But outside of that, what you eat and sleep and potentially maybe supplements are going to be the only things that are going to make these big rocks forward on these things rather than like these ice baths or Norma Tech boots or foam rolling or all the things that are, trust me, if I could quick fix my recovery, I would be doing it. But unfortunately, it just looks a lot like going to bed really early. <laughs> <laughs> it's less sexy. It's not, it's not, yeah. Yeah.